Ah, oh, yeah.
All right, uh, it's 4.30 and I think we got all the commissioners here. So first I'm gonna confirm all notices and everything were done correctly in the time frames. I noticed there was one item on the agenda that had an issue. Uh, DR 2216, uh, the application was not mailed correctly. The notices were not, uh, so it will be noticed and heard in August. Okay. I know we talked about before. Is there any way we can really specify that they need to use mailing and not physical address? Um, we have a document that we send out when we say you have to do your mailings that kind of goes through that. Um, making people read is sometimes a challenge. <laughs> sure. the page. Yeah. Be bigger, bold. Right. So anything we can help to avoid that. So. All right, um, with that done, let's do roll call. All right, uh, Commissioner Lyons? Here. Commissioner Tunnel? Here. Commissioner Nemec? Here. Commissioner Kinzer? Here. Commissioner Rock? Here. Commissioner Moss? Here. Commissioner Milfeef is absent. All right, we have a quorum. I um, also want to remind all commissioners that if you've had any items on the agenda that have any conflicts of interest or any ex parte communication, please bring that to our attention at the time of that application. All right, uh, going forward, we can do a review and approve of the minutes. Uh, anybody have any additions, concerns, questions on the May 17th or the June 7th meeting minutes? I will move we approve the minutes from May 17th and June 17th. Second. Or 7th, I'm sorry. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? Motion carries. Minutes are approved. All right, we'll move on to the preliminary development plans. And we have a pre-application for SUV application and a conditional use permit uh, for 207-217 Simon Street. Steve Callen? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah, we got you up front here, Steve. <laughs> Your name and address? Absolutely. I'm with Steve Callen, 385 Rio Vista. Uh, looking to do a project on Simmons Street. It's a five unit to be sold as townhouse, 1,300 square foot each, uh, shop space with living quarters above. Okay. Um, you mentioned there, the sewer it, mm -hmm. the lines are running there close enough for you. Absolutely. I've already been with the, the city for the uh, sewer and water. Uh, we talked over plans on how we're going to get back to the property and uh, we're actually. Uh, everything's there and ready to hook into under Scott Street. Now the road is roughed in. Or or I mean, the road, no. the road is it? The road, I know no. some of them, that's the one coming behind with the alley, right? Right. Um, so Simmons, Simmons does not exist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Simmons will be between us and the RV park, and that will be a dead end. If not, you're down in the down in the used to be a pit. So you're anticipating. Bringing that to city specs, or is the um, I've I've talked with them about it. I think this is nobody wants it, so it'll probably be more of a private road. Uh, and if allowed, we will keep that uh, uh, finished out in gravel. Uh, the actual units themselves will all face west, uh, and of course. Well, there's this is actually uh, what we're calling oh. Simon Street. The road, yeah, yeah, the one that's not labeled that. That's a, a relatively early uh, preliminary drawing of it. It'll be a good looking structure. Uh, there are some of these pop outs like this that aren't going to happen. We're not going to make it any larger than the square footage we already have. But that kind of shows, you know, what we got going on. Already spoke with the fire department. Uh, they have uh, 
given me the uh, preliminary green light. The, the Garrett's uh, happy with what we've got there as far as getting the uh, anything that might happen so he's able to take care of us. The uh, alley behind it, we're not, we're not doing anything with that. Uh, I am taking steps. Um, some of you know I've been where you are. I'm taking steps to try to not make it easy to turn into an Airbnb type thing I, I, in the design. I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, these are intended to be a work shop uh, <clears throat> with uh, residents above. You going to consider doing deed restrictions on that? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, we're considering it. I've there's a lot to happen between now and then, but yes. They have to be sprinkler. Unfortunately, that size. Yeah. yeah. I thought maybe we could squeak by, but they're telling me now. Yeah, because of the overall size. Mixed oh. use. Oh, it's the mixed use, and I I can put in one heck of a fire barrier and and make make that thing work. Uh, but what I'm coming back with is the multi use checks the box that I can't uncheck. So, but they'll be good looking buildings. They're not going to be something that uh, really looks like they're going to be a uh, red iron structure, um, mostly steel. Um, even though they get this drawn this way, it's going to be a mono slope, a little more modern looking uh, roof line. We're not going to go with what that started as, but it will have five units. I think it'll fill a niche that McCall needs, or at least it'll fill what I need. <laughs> yeah, I can get more other people that want one too, right? <laughs> That's my plan. Is it a garage downstairs or a shop? It's more of a shop. We got a 14 foot tall roll up door with 16 foot ceiling. If a guy needs to work on his dump truck, you can back it in there and work. What people need to do that? Yeah, okay. That that was my personal need that I have a dump truck, but I want to be able to get whatever. Let's say I got a fifth wheel that I need to get out of the weather. I can back that in there. I can do do what I need to do there, and I got enough ceiling. Could you orient me just a little bit? I don't know, Brian, you sure. that satellite. Um, you know, broken horn. Yeah, brewery. Yeah, okay. But so the there's, parachute there's there. There's our broken horn. There's our RV park. Those two buildings and airplane. Yeah. That's your biggest landmark you can find. Yeah. Okay, so it's right right there south of the airplane, I guess. Uh-huh. Okay. That's okay. exactly where I'm at. Yep. Hmm. So they'll face to the face to the west. Yep. And then put in a private road on that west side. Right. And depending on where you're looking, that's called Simmons. Okay. So it could be a it could be whatever the city asks us to put on there, or it could be just private drive. Right. Is it it's already zoned mixed use right now? Is that what I think it's, it's industrial? I, I think it is industrial. Industrial. Yeah. Oh, right. Commissioners, any other questions for Steve? No. Nope. Any other questions for us, Steve? I think no, no I, I think project. I think we're we're moving along with it as far as you know going through the proper channels to make sure that everything's proper. Um, it's really quite simple. It's just a matter of uh, just the whole mixed use is creating uh, a little more work here. Originally, I wasn't going to have any living quarters and and I got a lot of feedback. Uh, people, in fact, Whitetail is talking about wanting to buy three of them for their pilots, uh, which wouldn't be a bad deal, right? We don't have the potential for all the things we have potentials for in McCall. 10 snowmobile trailers and all the people trying to, you know, Airbnb it out. But in the design itself, I'm trying to make it not easy to uh, 
necessarily lock out one side from the other. I don't, I know how it is and given an inch, you know, and we'll have the CCNRs and we'll go ahead and have all that as far as uh, no Airbnb usage and things like that. Um, but we all know in the fall, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough thing. But if I can keep those people from uh, utilizing it as two separate entities, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to, with my design, make it not lock out. Like someone wants to lock out the shop and let somebody come use upstairs. I, it's a tough one. I mean, there's pros and cons to both sides of it, you know, but I really want to, I, we have enough Airbnbs. We don't need five more or four more. So that's my number one goal in this project is try to keep that thing more, more industrial, hopefully like a, a cabinet shopper or, or something that they want to fire up their business and they have enough room to actually work downstairs and have their, their place upstairs. None of those units are going to be finished out upstairs that I'm aware of today. And what I'm saying there is if someone comes and buys a unit and wants the top finished out, that's why we're going through this so that we have that um, option available. Mm -hmm. That affect your CFO? No, I've already talked to John about it. What we'd have is we'd have a somewhat of a TI permit. So you'd you'd have the CFO for the shop and you'd have to pull a separate permit for the tenant improvement for upstairs mm -hmm. and uh, you know completely separate uh, inspections as well as uh, CFO for that. So but the upstairs will be constructed as a second story. It just won't be finished out. Correct. Gotcha. So are you, you've just got an inside access to the upstairs? Correct. Yeah. So that's how you're hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And on the another sheet, you got them all right there on the cloth pad. It's kind of crude, but. Nonetheless, it, it's kind of showing you a potential second story usage. Uh, two bed, kitchen, bath, uh, laundry being under the stairs, accessible only from the shop. Um, and a little powder, I guess you wouldn't call it. You'd call that more of a mud bathroom downstairs. Um, so if it was finished out, it'd be a uh, two bed, two bath. I would finish out. And hopefully, Mark can hold you this <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> I've been down this road a time or two. We are going to have a little uh, sliding glass door and and uh, patio or what do we want to call that? I guess porch, second story porch upstairs. Just more of a place for a couple chairs. You could sit there. Watch the sun go down if you want it. OK, commissioners, any other questions, comments? Nope. Thanks, me. Thanks, Steve. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Very much. Well. <laughs> OK, uh, the next thing we have is the uh, code of amendment. It's Michelle. Um, I'm guessing. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah. Great. Um, so the item in front of you today is a whole series of code amendments that we've been working on, um, mostly with the city council. And so this is a pre-application meeting to introduce the concepts. Um, first off, uh, we had two work sessions with the city council starting last December and then in February of 2022. And then we kind of, we got general direction from the council council on policy um, direction, but then kind of put this on hold because we're working with the county right now 
um, on an impact area review, which is a 10 year review process. And so generally speaking, we always have the same codes for the city and then the county within the impact area. Um, and so we didn't necessarily, initially we, we thought, well, we don't really wanna have them be different. However, we feel like the issue of short-term rentals within the city is, is slightly different because um, we do administer a business license process and we do collect local option tax. So we felt like maybe this is one that we could take the lead on. And if the county decides um, they want to adapt portions of this to make it more similar, um, that would work. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, we first started regulating um, just the large short-term rentals. So these were the short-term rentals that sleep 20 or more. And um, we regulate them through a conditional use permit process. Um, and then, you know, after we did that for a while, that actually was um, challenged at one point. And then we we basically learned from the courts that we had the ability to um, manage the secondary impacts. And so then we went ahead and we started realizing, you know, as we got more and more of them and we got more and more complaints, um, we, we felt like it was important to put in standards for all short-term rentals. Um, so you can see in the memo that was provided um, under the current code, we currently manage parking, occupancy, noise, um, safety. We have posting requirements. We require that there's contact information for everybody that lives within 300 feet of the short-term rental. Um, we don't allow events. Um, also, in the cases where we have a primary house and an accessory dwelling unit, um, we require that one be owner occupied or one be a deed restricted local housing unit. Um, and that was put in place to make sure there's kind of management on site and we're not necessarily just getting investors who are turning these properties into kind of just investment properties. Um, the um, we have some provisions about camping and trash services. They need to have the bear-proof containers and that the trash service can serve the short-term rental. Um, and then we do require under the current code of business license. Um, and, and then it's obviously subjected to, to code enforcement. So we've been working with that code section for about a year and a half. Um, and basically the McCall Fire District um, contacted us and we had a several, a whole series of meetings with the fire chief and the building official and a number of other folks, um, our clerk's department. Um, and ultimately, um, I think there's some real concerns about health safety in terms of things that we're seeing within short-term rentals. So um, we did kind of form this partnership and we came up and brainstormed a whole list of ideas on ways we can better manage short-term rentals to one, mitigate health safety issues as well as neighborhood impacts. So um, we did hire a consultant to help us um, do some research and kind of craft some preliminary language. Um, we're still working on the ordinance development itself, but um, I'll just give you a rundown of the suggested changes um, that we're looking at bringing forth to the McCall Area Planning and Zoning and then the McCall City Council. So um, some of these actually span beyond things you guys typically see. You mostly deal with um, Title III, which is planning and zoning, and you also deal with Title IX, which is subdivision and development. So um, some of this gets into Title IV, which is more um, within the realm of things that the city clerk does in terms of permitting. Um, but first off, what we're looking at changing is um, changing the business license to a specific short-term rental permit. Um, so that would be specific for these short-term rentals. Um, we would also require that th there be a short-term rental permit for each unit on each property. Um, currently, actually, um, property managers are able to get one business license and manage a whole series of short-term rentals, and that makes it um, a little bit difficult for on the enforcement side. Um, we're looking at revising our fee schedule to make sure that we're actually covering administrative costs. Um, so that's something that we would need to do in addition to these ordinance changes. Um, and then we, we've we been working with, as I mentioned, with the fire district about establishing an inspection process. So they're actually looking at hiring somebody to specifically um, do physical inspections of all the short-term rentals 
Um, and they would have a health safety checklist um, that the, the owners would need to comply with. Um, and then that inspection would need to be completed prior to us issuing the permit. Um, we're also asking for in the application process, a floor and a site plan as part of that. Um, that way we can just verify that everything looks okay. Right now we have them basically just um, sign a declaration of compliance saying that they're gonna comply with all of the code things, but we don't necessarily specifically look at, um, you know, the site plan, is there enough parking or is there too much parking on all of those things? So we're gonna look um, a little bit deeper. So we're definitely investing more time on the front end. Um, we also thought it was um, important to invest time on the enforcement side. So establishing um, a fee schedule um, and basically kind of a three strikes and you're out rule. So if you were to receive um, basically three, if you had, were to have three offenses, um, you would basically, um, your permit could be suspended for a permit of two years. So that's basically on the permitting side. Um, the other suggested changes that we're looking at on the land use side, um, basically adding some definitions, um, and then this is probably the big one that will, will be, I'm guessing, the most controversial in the public hearing process. Um, we did hold a series of focus groups with property managers and property owners who have short-term rentals. Um, and currently we allow four persons per bedroom. And so that's what determines occupancy. And then kind of just in doing more research, um, we, we were suggesting a two person per bedroom for an occupancy, which is definitely just more residential in character. Um, and, and then there would be a process, you know, if you wanted to exceed that, you know, the 10 persons, there's some other standards we're looking at sprinkling. And some of this is sort of linked back to fire code and building code. Um, so um, access is really important, especially, um, on the fire side is making sure, you know, fire and EMS are able to um, easily access some of these properties. Um, we're also making sure exterior changes um, um, that they basically look like a residential home and not necessarily um, a commercial property as such. So, um, so that's just a high level overview of what we're thinking. Um, we would bring you um, hopefully a specific ordinance with the exact language. Um, we don't have that totally completed at this point. So I just wanted to give you an overview and see if you had any questions or concerns. We're trying to roll this out relatively quickly. Um, so we're looking at hopefully bringing this back to you in August, um, if that works with the schedule. Um, and then you know hopefully getting this completed sometime in September. Um, and that way that'll work with our clerks who actually have to renew, um, the, the permitting on their side. So, um, so that's a general overview and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah. So you're talking about the fine, $300 fine. Yeah. The way I read, you know, the way I read this is only two violations and before you suspend the license. Right. That's correct. Okay. That's good. I don't think they should be allowed three. Michelle, on the on the bedroom limitations, it's kind of hard to think that one size fits all. I mean, up here with a variety of homes that we have, you got a 10 by 10 room or you might have a 20 by 40 room. And it could be something more of the size determines this space because there's lots of big bonus rooms that mm -hmm. Can it easily handle more than two people? Yeah, um, so we we had pretty extensive conversations about um, that, and I think that came up in a lot of the focus groups. I mean, what we're trying to move away from are those kind of like bunk rooms. However, it's it's total occupancy. So, I mean, you could transfer your occupancy from say you only have one person sleeping in one of the bedrooms. It's the overall occupancy of the structure. So it's just number of bedrooms times two, and then how you allocate it within the house um, would be up to the, the homeowner. I think from a health safety issue, 
you know, what our fire district is really concerned about is we've seen a lot of instances where people are um, creating spaces in basements that don't have ingress and egress or um, in some of these cases, right, you've got people in these in these kind of crammed into these rooms um, and don't really have a clear way to, to get out if there is a fire. So, so that's our concern. I mean, the state code is pretty specific about, um, we can't prohibit them obviously. And so what we're talking about is managing secondary impacts for the specific purpose of health safety, as well as um, we do want these to sort of act, um, look and act like residential homes within our residential neighborhoods. And um, continually we get a ton of complaints and a lot of the issues arise from ones where it really is an issue of people kind of cramming people into these homes. And um, when you start getting like large numbers of people in these homes, right, they don't, they don't, they don't act um, and the impact of the neighborhood is much more than a, like a single family house. So, so that's the, that's the rationale um, around the occupancy piece. I'm imagining there's going to be a lot of discussion. Um, we just felt like this is a good place to start the conversation if the PNZ and the city council um, ultimately want to modify that. That's that's really a policy choice. But um, our fire district also mentioned that they're just not interested in having it be kind of like an arbitrary thing like they they want some pretty clear guidance on that whole occupancy piece so um so that's why we ultimately did move away from like size of rooms um and and thought you know like obviously there are some homes that this may not necessarily be you know there they might have more space but they can maybe allocate some of the occupancy to those like larger rooms I mean, generally speaking, you don't have four people sleeping in every bedroom in a, in a house. So um, so in this case, it would be two is what is sort of the starting place. What do you do for, I mean, you think anything on kids? Is there an exemption or not exemption, but at a certain age, do you count them or not count them? Um, we did talk about that because when we reviewed other ordinances from other kind of mountain town communities, sometimes there was kind of a plus two or kids under a certain age exempt. Um, ultimately, this like initial recommendation doesn't include that because that becomes very hard to enforce. Um, and especially, you know, a lot of the platforms like a VRBO or an Airbnb um, they just, they don't ask for how many kids versus adults. They just ask for total occupants. Um, so we thought this was just easier oh to my administer. God, I have to put my kids. Yeah, they all ask for kids. They have to put kids. their ages too. Yeah, typically ages and stuff are required in all of those. Um, it's something to consider because I think, you know, especially for the least thing, um, when you go and book it, you have to put how many kids are in yes. there. Yeah. And ages. Advertise occupancy on the thing that would, Everybody is public facing that we all see. Oh, yeah. Totally yeah, yeah when you're people, looking at your request, yeah. yeah. Um, now, out of curiosity, if we're doing that, somebody brought this to my attention. We're, we're limiting that to vacation rentals. How does that goes to them? How does that affect long term rentals? Because I know long term rentals that have packed a few people in the rooms without those requirements. Is there any legal issues when we? say one can do it and we're not enforcing anything on another? No, I don't think so. I mean, this is an ordinance that's um, specific um, to short-term rentals because um, because we're actually permitting that. We, we do not permit um, long-term rentals or do inspections on those at this point. Um, so this is a specific ordinance for short-term rentals. And we have had our legal look at this, um, at least initially, um, and and they they felt comfortable with making that distinction. So, the the code enforcement effort. Can you talk a little bit about that? How many people? Uh, what at what point will they go out and do an inspection? You know that kind of thing. It's. So the inspection will actually, you know, we'll continue to partner with McCall Fire. They'll actually have the checklist and do the inspection, and then they'll have to sign off um, that the, that the homeowners 
you know, pass the inspection or the short-term rental passes the inspection prior to us issuing the permit. Um, there are some logistics in how we roll this out. It, it's going to take a little while to get, you know, we have over 400 short-term rentals in the city currently. Um, and so to get them all up and running, like there's going to be probably a couple of years before we can make that happen because um, our fire chief has talked with other communities who do something similar. And obviously, you know, to I think the initially getting people into compliance, like they're probably not going to be in compliance the first time they do the inspection. Um, so it'll take them several, you know, times going back and kind of checking in. Um, so the, the inspection will happen, you know, prior to the permitting. Um, and then I think once we get it rolling and people know what the regulations are and are compliant, I think that'll go a little bit quicker. Um, we also are kind of restructuring our clerk's Clerk's department is looking at actually dedicating one of their staff members um, who already manages the local option tax to also manage um, the short-term rental process. So we'll basically, from a code enforcement standpoint, we've met with our police department, um, the new chief, as well as our code enforcement officer. We'll basically have like um, one point of contact at the city who is managing kind of the permitting piece um, of the short-term rental permit, and then kind of being the main contact between uh, law enforcement. Um, the other thing we will do is we will be building sort of a complaint form online. So if somebody has um, an issue with a short-term rental, they're able to document and upload, you know, photos or videos and a complaint um, if it's some weird time, <laughs> you know, and, and, and a city staff member is not available. So we'll like for the public, we're going to try to make a much more clear kind of um, way of reporting, like, you know, these types of violations. Yeah, so that so I'm sorry, so that that's what I was more getting at is the violation after the fact that they've been permitted. There needs to be a process of identifying a violation. And then going out and challenging the the permit holder and actually finding them and is that are we staffed to do that um yeah our our police department feels comfortable um that they would be able to do that and i think it's going to be a coordinated effort between our clerk's department and our our police department in terms of like actual issuing fines and um, notifications of violations and those kinds of things okay how's, michelle how's that work in the impact area Means the violations specifically. Yeah, so this is a this at this point is basically going to be just a city code, not an impact area code. Um, so there are existing, you saw in the memo, there are already existing regulations for the impact area, but because we don't have any jurisdiction in terms of enforcement, um, we're not proposing it at this time. The county commissioners have want to go through this 10 year review process. Um, I will be notifying them that we're starting the process of these code changes within the city limits in case they want to consider them, but they've kind of said they don't want to really uh, consider any new ordinances or code changes until we get through that review process. So hopefully property owners that are next to us, short-term rental like this, they'll kind of be the police, I guess, or the people that make a complaint against a violation in this particular thing in the impact area. Yeah, so um, the impact area will have basically the existing code in place, but it won't have this new language unless the county commissioners decide they want to adopt it, right? And so one of the things is we did have a joint meeting scheduled, and this is kind of going back, but um, because we wanted to have conversations with the county to see if they were interested. So we're the administrators of um, building and planning for the impact area but we aren't necessarily administrators of permitting um, things like, like a business license. We don't do that. That's That only happens in the city limits and it's in a different area of like our authority. So we were gonna ask them the question is, um, one, are you interested in having these kinds of regulations in the impact area? And then two, are you interested in basically city staff administering this for you. Um, the actual enforcement of it becomes a little tricky because um, 
to date, basically, you know, we we try to get voluntary compliance through our city staff in the impact area. And then if we're unable to do that, then we kick it to the um, Valley County Prosecutor's Office and then they pick it up from, from there. So we don't have like any police power um, as, you know, the city of McCall Police Department or anything or code enforcement um, within the impact area. So most of what we try to do in the impact area currently is just um, trying to get voluntary compliance through um, a couple of warnings and letter. Ryan writes a great code enforcement letter and amazingly he gets a lot of compliance. And then if for some reason they decide not to comply, then it gets kicked to the prosecuting attorney's office. Um, I, don't, I mean, to get you know certification over a two-year period seems like pretty extensive time. There is a company, I'm not sure if you're aware of, it's called, I believe it's Breezeway Company. It, the owner is a past fire chief, is certified, does all the various inspections. It might be something to contact for a company that could come in and, and that does this and able to shorten that time frame up so we're not two years out on on that. So I, I don't know what the cost would be. I don't know if it'd be something worthwhile. But, I mean, sounds like they know what they're doing on that. It might be something worth looking into to be able to get compliance or at least inspections done in a short period of time other than extended two years. Yeah, and I'm kind of throwing that out as probably like the long end of that range. Hopefully we can do it a lot quicker. Um, it's just hard to say um, because we're just at the very beginning of the process of trying to get the ordinances kind of through the process first. So well, I, I think imagine, once, yeah. once we start seeing, um, you know, when ordinances are adopted and, you know, we'll have to continue to partner with the McCall Fire District um, because for them it's staffing, right, and funding and all of those things. So we're all planning on doing this as part of our budget process. Um, and we've been talking about this for a while. So um, hopefully once, you know, once we have the kind of the framework in place, we can kind of hit the ground running doing it. I don't think it, this is, this is probably an ordinance that will come with controversy though, right? So, um, you know, we're fully anticipating um, that, you know, people, our, our sense was that most people were fine with the general regulations, in, at least in the focus groups. The, the big sticky issue was the occupancy piece. Um, and because ultimately, right, like it is a business for most, most people. So um, even though the state code says we can't treat it like a business. So that's the irony. But anyway, so, so I do think that's probably like when we get to public testimony, I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be, and we'll bring... Um, the research that we've done to date about other communities, what the requirements are, what their occupancy levels are, just so you can kind of benchmark to see like where we are compared to other communities and um, evaluate that. And we'll have the fire chief and the, um, the building official also be present at those meetings to answer a lot of the questions that you guys might have about health safety concerns or any specific regulations. Um. One more thing I got is you, you've got an item in higher re, uh, regarding events. Will there be something more specific on sizes? I mean, there's some houses that could have a small family reunion or small wedding get together and nobody would even know it, but versus, you know, 50 people or 100 people. Is there going to be something that has some definition and some size limitations? Because you know, if somebody's renting a place on the lake and want to have a small reception of some sort, how do you balance that? Yeah, um, I think we, what we were thinking was it would be linked to like the people staying there, um, but not necessarily the idea that you can have, um, I think it's what what the issue that we've had in the past is right, people having basically like these homes as they're like having weddings every weekends and things like that. So um, I think there probably will be some sidebars in terms of defining that. I'm not sure what those are at this point. Okay. okay. So Michelle, I have a question about um, vehicles and specifically trailers. And if there was any consideration to change the language with um, the number of trailers that can be at one of these short term rent rentals and, and whether you figure them in as a, like an actual vehicle, because I see some of your languages, there's a one vehicle per bedroom. But you really start to overrun, you know, driveways and stuff if everybody shows up with a trailer. 
Yeah, so I think we actually said that all the parking has to be on site, um, no trailers on the street. Um, let me just go to what our current language is. Um, our current la language, yeah, is is one parking space per bedroom. All trailers shall be parked on surface area if space is provided um, and shall not be parked in the right of way. And that's a complaint we often get is just trailers all over the right of ways. And then we can't get emergency services as well as other people can't get through, especially in the winter in some of the streets, they get pretty narrow. Um, so we weren't necessarily thinking about limiting trailers as long as they could fit them on site. Um, but I'm sorry, like, can you repeat your question? Well, I, I guess my, yeah, I'm just wondering, because I know that that is an issue, is people show up, they fit underneath that criteria of one vehicle per bedroom, but what happens is it just spills over and it ends up being a problem for the city to manage, especially during winter when there's no parking anywhere. So, I mean, if you if you change that language to where a, a trailer is actually counted as a vehicle, then it really reduces how much, you know, how many things can be in the driveway itself. And it might help with that problem. Okay, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. I'll pass that on. At some point when I was reading through this, and maybe I misunderstood, but is there, did I read something either in our suggestions or maybe in some of the research about there was the two bedroom occupancy, but I thought that I read something about the possibility of getting that increased with inspections. Did I read that somewhere or is that not? Um, I think that was discussed in our focus groups and I think, you know, we still need to kind of formulate the final language on it. Um, you know, again, we were probably going to just sort of start at two persons per bedroom. Um, and you know, my sense from the fire district was they didn't like what would be the criteria for allowing additional people and they didn't want um, it to be totally discretionary. Like mm. they would, and so, cause they didn't necessarily like, you know, their concern, they'll be double checking everything, all the standards, but really their concern is health safety. And so they just didn't want to get in the business of, okay, you're allowed to have six and you're allowed to have 12 or that kind of gotcha. thing. Um, and that's where we ultimately kind of landed on like more of a bright line rule of two persons per bedroom and allocate it however you want within the home. I see. Yeah, Thank I you. think that would be issues, but there's a lot of homes with loft style bedrooms and not technically a bedroom. Um, and a lot of big, big bonus rooms that, you know, I see there'll be some concerns. Yeah, I mean, we got into the whole discussion too of, you know, what constitutes a bedroom. And so, um, the approach we thought the easiest approach would be just to go ahead and use the assessor's information. So a lot of people will like throw a sleeper couch in, but if it's not technically defined as a bedroom, you wouldn't necessarily get that as your occupancy. Um, generally speaking, like most of our short term rentals are actually not that large. You know, they tend to be more of the three bedroom, four bedroom. So they're going to fall under a lot of these thresholds. Um, I'd be cautious. It's, it's, it assessor. ends up being more like the bunk rooms where it's like double queens and there's, you know, the loft that sleeps 20 and that kind of thing. I'd be cautious using the assessors because a lot of times I find, and I use a lot, the assessment system is not accurate for that true bedroom count in house, especially older homes okay. when they don't have the records. New homes, they have the building plans and they're pretty accurate. The old ones, I find it quite often that the assessor is not accurate on the bedroom bathroom count. So. I okay. might want to not really rely on that 100%. Mm -hmm. Or they might have to admit they have more bedrooms and pay more taxes then. They might. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a lot that aren't, you know, especially as they say, the older homes, it's not necessarily, yeah. but they may have done a remodel and it's not showing up in the assessors. Yeah, so that could be an incentive for people to submit new plans if they've remodeled too. Any further questions? I just I have one, Michelle. I've, we're, we're, on number A, where it says if short-term rental is located on a parcel that contains an accessory dwelling unit 
as a primary residence, then one of the of the dwellings must be owner occupied for a local for local housing. Not short term. Does that mean that the the, 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 the uh, it has to be owner occupied at the time that, you, that you're renting them out? Or mm -hmm. I don't quite understand it. And what constitutes a accessory dwelling? Uh, some of these places I see have a garage with a a shop area in there, and they have a buck that I've seen. And is that considered an accessory dwelling, or how, 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 can you just interpret that one for a little, little bit for me? Sure. Actually, Brian's the expert on accessory dwelling, so he can give you the rundown of our code. Yeah. So, uh, an accessory dwelling unit is a separate living quarters that has all the requirements for independent living. That so, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom, generally, um, and yeah completely inaccessible via interior means in and out of the two units. So if there's a firewall or something between the two, or it's a completely separate, like you said, detached garage that has all those elements, then it counts an accessory dwelling unit. Okay. If, if it's an arms leak situation where there's a freeze way that's maybe not connected in that same manner, is it still the same thing? Yeah. It would, Still be a still be an independent structure, yeah. and if it has less than any of those qualifications as far as kitchen and bit, and it, it is not right. considered. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Michelle? I would just add if you guys have any additional questions or suggestions, feel free to contact me after the meeting. Um, like I said, we're still basically developing the ordinance. Um, so happy to to take any questions or comments. Oh, you know what, Michelle, there's one thing that I did talk with uh, Kelly. And I don't know if it sounds like this is something new, but maybe something down the road to be aware of. There's we've got some type of new noise aware system that actually counts the people in the house. It can trace their, I guess, their voice and it would uh, alert the, uh, well, the dog. Yeah, well, <laughs> they, they track the different type of voices. How they do it, I don't know, but it's there. Uh, it's being used right now. And it might be another way, especially on some of the larger ones, to require some of the property management companies maybe to look at that. I mean, it might be something to look into. I, I would suggest talking with Kelly Hill about that. She knows more about it, but it seemed pretty unique and a way from people not sneaking people into the house. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. All right. We'll move on to the next item. We've got our consent agenda. Multiple items on there. Does anybody want to pull any of those items off to discuss separately, or are you good with the agenda as listed? I was good as listed, I think. Yeah, I didn't have any more questions. Yeah, I'm good. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, the consent agenda has been approved. Okay. We have no old business. We'll move on to the new business. And that's revocation agreement relating to record of survey 2027. And uh, Bill, I guess Bill is going to be presenting. Bill Punkin. In the city. Hi there. Um, yeah, I think Brian uh, Parker and I are going to tag team this one. Uh, Brian, did you want me to run with this or do you want to start off? Yeah, I think it might be good for you to kind of go over the rationale. Yeah, sure. OK, so uh, in your packet and I'm pulling that up just now. Um, uh, where to go in your packet? Uh, you have a, an agreement. And I want to get to the right of the agenda bill so I can see this where I am. Um, so RS 2027. Here we go. There it is. Um, we had a situation, um, I think, where 
Um, the PNZ Commission granted a record of survey dividing one lot into two. And uh, this was done in reliance upon uh, some uh, assertions and representations made by one owner of that property. And it turns out the other owners of the property uh, were not, did not agree to the record of survey and everybody agreed that they wanted to basically put it back. And so um, when this was presented to me um, about how do we do this, um, I looked at our code and there were basically two options. The first was go back through the subdivision process, which would take uh, months and months and months. And the alternative would be that we reverse the record of survey, which the deeds were not recorded. Is that correct, Brian? Yeah, um, that's correct. And so um, we could reverse it by agreement. And, and that's what this is, is is this is an agreement order revoking the record of survey that was granted um, on uh, lots 22 and 23 um, of Lick Creek Meadows subdivision phase one. So uh, the property owners uh, elected to go with option two, which was the by contract, which I think is by far the most expedient and cost efficient way forward. Uh, I worked with their attorney to get this drafted up. Uh, it's basically a no harm, no foul. And we go back to the uh, way the lot had been prior to uh, the approval of the record of survey. Any, Brian, did you want to add anything on this? Yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. So, uh, like Bill said, this uh, couldn't be a new record of survey. It would have to go through the full subdivision preliminary final plat. Uh, because our record of survey code explicitly calls out re, -combi re uncombining combined parcels as something you can't do. Um, and it was also approved under a different code than currently exists that allowed for smaller lot sizes than the minimum lot size in the zone. Uh, so they would have had to add 300 square feet or something like that to one of the parcels uh, to get it in conformance with it. So it require full new surveying out there could just use the old survey um, and so this is a more expedient way to get to uh, roughly the same outcome um, one thing on this I realize which property is and it actually should have said before uh, I did have some preliminary discussions oh, several months ago um, with I believe the agent and the owners um, about this, they had questions. What can we do? I forward them to you. And so I did have some discussions, but no, I mean, it was before, I think, or right when they were talking to you as well. Okay, we appreciate that disclosure. In any event, we, we recommend uh, that the commission uh, approve this agreement and authorize the chairman to execute it on behalf of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And and with looking at this, I mean, it is part of the original plat that was approved with Lick Creek Meadows. Everything was done through the normal process, the hookups, all that. Now, was it ever, this wouldn't cause any issue. They would still have the two sewer hookups because the sewer district has it as rated as two lots. Speak with Jeff Bateman on that. And they said that the two, two hookups are still, are still okay. So that doesn't change. They don't have any issues with that. Okay. I'd make a motion that we approve record of survey 2207. The revocation agreement. Yeah, the rev revocation agreement. And and that we, uh, what was it? That Auth you asked? Authorize the chairman to execute the agreement on behalf of the commission. And that off, and we also are, uh, approval and uh, and recognize that the chairman has the authorization to move forward with it. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. All right, motion is carried. Uh, the revocation agreement has been approved. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll move on to 
Design Review 2212 and Shoreline 2203 at 121 Kiki Court. Uh, I guess Mike here. Eric, get Mike Mike's there. Right there. Chairman, members of the commission, Mike Robnett, on side of 1002 Violet Way. I'm here to represent uh, Eric and Rebecca Giddens. Been working on design on their place on the river for several months now. Um, they're looking to come up and join our community, hopefully early spring when we complete the project. Um, worked with Brian kind of extensively on some wetlands issues down there. There was a lot of hidden information that we had to go and, and dig up, which took some some work. But uh, we uh, on the plat, it shows a, a, a wetlands line that runs through the lot and through the existing road. And it's I don't not sure why it's still on the plat, but after some after a little research, we discovered that all of those lots in the entire road, that entire section subdivision was. Uh, Allowed to be filled up and, and has been remediated through the through the previous process. It just is not reflected on the plat. So um, we are allowed to push the the site setback, which gave us uh, the room we needed. It's a beautiful structure. Um, the landscape plan is in there. Um, scroll through. So you guys have all the elevations and everything in your packet. Um, so I will let you know, commissioners, the printer exploded like six different times trying to print the rendered images, so they're just too high quality. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I'll let them come next time. <laughs> I'll give you one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pretty straightforward application, beautiful addition to the subdivision, and I'll stand for any questions. I think this lot's in and up because we had an issue with one of the end lots in there. This is the end lot. This is was there an issue with that easement or access? I can't remember. There was well, we had in the past. On. So, so there is a, there, this lot is accessed through an easement and uh, there was some utilities that were not uh, terminated onto the lots. So the power's already been uh, moved or, or completed rather. Um, the sewer last year we did get with uh, Jeff and the sewer department and we brought sewer back to this property. Um, which was still up front, and that just leaves hooking up to the existing water meter. So, yeah, it is the, the very end lot. Okay, so I was thinking there was something that I could remember. What yeah, it, act, it shares an easement with designed to be with 117, 125 accessed. It was just an easement, so anybody could use it. So instead of, he probably should have just gone off the street, but he didn't. So he reads up the easement too. So it's going to be uh, three. Three addresses on that easement. Um, so, but yeah, we've got the utilities. We sorted most of that out last year. Um, we got with the sewer department, and the sewers already run back there. Commissioners, any other questions for Mike? For me. All right. Not yet. Uh, thank you. Report. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so this application is for a single family residence within shoreline zone. Um, architecturally meets McCall design guidelines. Uh, pretty consistent roof lines and uh, lots of windows and generally natural materials and colored palette um, meet setback requirements. So the only real site design issue we ran into was uh, the uh, Floodplain on here encroaches a little bit into the property um, along here. And so the 50 foot shoreline setback actually starts at the edge of this blue line as shown here. Um, and so the house needs to be pushed up just a little bit further, um, which they're already bumping up on the snow storage easement that's shown on the plat on the other side. So it require a little reconfiguration, but I think we can get through that after the meeting. Um, and there's some lawn area shown on the uh, site plan within the 50 foot shoreline setback. Uh, but other than that, I think it looks pretty good and uh, recommend approval of it. Stand for any questions. Any questions for Ryan before we go to Morgan? 
All right, so we have Morgan here today with us. Hello. <laughs> um, so reviewing this application and the materials, they didn't submit any stormwater items. So my first comment in my letter is breaking down what needs to be submitted to show compliance with our drainage management guidelines before they'll get final engineering approval. Um, and then I just had a comment regarding the wetlands, but it sounds like we're figuring that out or it's been solved. Um, and then just doing the water meter sizing to show if a 5 8 meter would be sufficient to support the home. And that's all of my major comments for this project. All right, Commissioner, any questions for Morgan? Nope. Right. This is a public hearing. We'll open up this item for uh, public comments. Is there anybody on you know, online that would like to comment regarding this application, either online or on the phone? Uh, if you're online and you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. I've got a list here. I don't think there's. Yeah, and that's on numbers. That's not here. So okay. Okay. Anybody online, give a couple more seconds. You may need to hit star six to talk in case you're muted. Is there anybody here in the audience that would like to speak regarding this application? <clears throat> okay, hearing no comments, so close the public hearing. And commissioners, discussion. Any issues at all? Seems good, as long as they take care of the couple of water yeah. line issues. issues and then and then final engineering. Mm -hmm. Say in the past, I know there was an easement things in the past on a previous application. I think that's been taken care of. So yeah, I'm keep reading that phone. Yeah. Well, I would make a motion that we approve design review 2212 and shoreline 2203 with the conditions of approval as dated. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote. All right, motion carries. <coughs> Item has been approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, I believe. The next item list that was on my agenda, design review 2216, has been postponed. And also, design review 2217 has been postponed. No, we're going to go ahead and do that one. We're going to do that one. That works for you guys. Okay. Let me go back to that. That lost my internet. Hmm? I put it in at the beginning of the packet, and then we had a. We removed it and then we came back in after. <laughs> okay, so we have design review 2217 and 1425. Chris Lane, uh, Pat Miniger. Yes, sir. Okay, Pat. Is that for us? Thank you. Um, purchased on last year and please state your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Pat Miniger, 1425 Chris Lane, McCall, and purchased home last year and <clears throat> wanted to build a, a nice big shop and didn't understand the limitations I was about to incur. So we've been trying to pull the Chevrolet through a knot hole, if you will. And uh, now we're <clears throat> we're looking at a 3,600 square foot shop. Um, with uh, accessory dwelling and a uh, heat restriction. Um, the shop is uh, like the home. It's going to be beautiful. Um, it's just for toys. We have four generations using uh, using the home. Fortunate enough to have parents still alive. And, uh, and we, <clears throat> we seem to accumulate a fair amount in, in taking care of the property. I have tractors and lawn equipment and so forth that I'd like to keep under uh, under roof. I stand for the We do understand that uh, we didn't have our central health district permit. Um, we arose some confusion we submitted, which is our third submit. Um, 
due to our our confusion out there. And, uh, and we thought that it was all and uh, found out that just as of about three hours ago, we submitted some last paperwork to them. So we're looking for a, possibly a, a move forward uh, uh, based on um, that getting handled correctly. OK, that was going to be my question. You knew that because it was approved without the ADU, but now you're having to research it to get approved. Yeah, we had to, we had to submit some some just dimensions and some definition on the drawings um, as of late today, and we, we didn't know there was any concerns. So um, when we reached out today after um, we found out that you didn't have it yet, then that's what we found out. So as within even 30 minutes of coming to this meeting, we gave them the last dimension that they wanted. And uh, so we had hoped that you guys could possibly approve it from, from this point forward, subject to obviously that approval. And Brian, this wasn't the one that had the letter regarding the architect review. That was yeah. Valley View, right? Sent out today. Yeah, that it was pulled out of face, but as I was okay. pretty sure I didn't get confused with this one. I didn't think it was. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for the applicant? Nope. Not yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this application is for a 3,600 square foot accessory building. Um, our code requires any accessory structures over 1,500 square feet to include a deed restricted local housing unit. Uh, so this was something that we were thinking we could do administratively, uh, but um, as Michelle discussed earlier, the county commissioners uh, opted not to move forward with any code amendments uh, for until we do our area of impact review. Um, we'll discuss later in this meeting. Uh, and so it is still a commission level design review for any accessory dwelling units. Um, and so, yeah, it's a large shop uh, with a deed restricted local housing unit upstairs. Um, yeah, really the main challenge with getting the approval on it is uh, proof of adequate septic service on site. Um, and so I'm requesting that you add a condition of approval to the staff report uh, to include requiring proof of septic permit, prior additions of building permit. Uh, and with that, I'll stand for any questions. There's any questions for Ryan before we go to Morgan? It's not Morgan. Awesome. Um, so this one's easy. I just sent out final engineering approval mm -hmm. today. For this project um, with the relatively small footprint on the prod on the whole property there weren't many concerns regarding stormwater and it's off of a private driveway um, so we just needed a stormwater application and a site plan that shows uh, temporary BMPs that were being placed so that's been provided and they were received final engineering approval today okay any questions for Morgan Right, this is a public hearing. We'll open up a public hearing. Is there anybody online or on the phone that would like to comment on this application? Again, you may need to hit star six if you're muted. It'll take a few seconds. There is none. Is there anybody here to comment on this application? Seeing none. All right, we will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, any questions for our discussion? I should say. I think the main thing that I thought was the making sure the septic was approved through Central District Health <laughs> for. Um, yeah. So, Brian, what was the condition that you wanted added? Uh, proof of? Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide proof of a septic permit. Um, that allows for an ADU. Right. They have a permit that it doesn't mm -hmm. allow for an ADU. So for the ADU. I'm sorry. 
prior to the issuance of a building permit. Yes, I can see building permit. Proof of septic permit that allows. Thank you, Rady. Um, I move to approve. What are we on? Thank you, DR 2217, with the additional condition that the applicant provide proof of septic permit that allows an ADU to the city prior to the issuance of a building permit. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? You know, the motion is approved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to final plat 2201, the Bighorn subdivision. Is Sasha with us? Is that who's presenting? Yeah. Or are you saying Steve? Good evening. Good evening, Steve. We can hear you. OK, um, this is final plan approval for the Bighorn subdivision. Um, uh, it's a fairly straightforward uh, small project. Uh, I have reviewed the staff report and the proposed conditions of approval, um, and we have no objections to any of them. OK. Commissioners, uh, any questions for Steve? No. All right. Uh, Brian, staff report. All right. Thank you. Yes, this is a final plat application uh, for a 12 lot subdivision uh, with a private street uh, off of Burrito Road. Um, like Steve said, it's pretty straightforward. It uh, not a whole lot to talk about. It. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm talking in the preliminary plat stage of it and got a lot of answers figured out at that point. So pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Stand for any questions. I saw it in here, but the fire department is good with that hammerhead, right? There's plenty of space for that. They're all fine. I'm sure it was. Yeah, they did. They moved that road. Remember, it was it was jogged. Before. Yeah, they did have a little jog. Well, yeah. yeah, the road coming across from Broken Ridge Pond, right? Yeah. And so that's no longer. No, it lines up. Still there, they're just aligned now. It just lined yeah. up, yeah. So the lots on the west side are slightly smaller. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because there was that little bump we had. So, uh, Morgan, any? Yeah. Um, so there's a few comments on the plot that just need to be addressed, and we need digital drawings to show that they comply with the digital data stand submission standards, um, and then they can get final plot approval. And then we'll have to have a meeting with the team on if they are going to do any financial guarantees for the public infrastructure, or if they're going to finish that before we sign the plot. Um, at this point, at this point, uh, there is no plan for financial guarantees. Awesome. So it, it, my understanding would be that the infrastructure items would be complete before the plat is recorded. Great, that makes that simple. All right, commissioners, any discussion or questions for staff or an applicant? <clears throat> Seems like they addressed one of the major things. Yeah. That road being lined up. Yeah, that was my recollection. That's the biggest one from the preliminary plan. Um, well, this is not a public hearing, so I'm going to have to do that. So. Looking for a motion. We can be ready for a motion. I would move that we approve final plat 2201 for Bighorn subdivision. Or does this have to be the city council? Yes, yeah, a recommendation. Recommendation to the city council that mm -hmm. they approve final plat 2201. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries and final plat is approved. Thank you, Steve. 
Thank you. All right. Now, I guess we drop down to scheduling the other stuff. That's Brian or? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take this. Oh, this is on the last page of your packet. Science and science notes from Valley Let's County. The, the binder? Oh. Not in the binder. Not in the binder. That's the county the commissioner letter. Oh, yeah, that's where we're at right now. Scheduling this meeting. Right. Oh. oh. The oh scheduling that meeting. Yes. Oh, okay. Work session mm -hmm. waiting. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, county commissioners have. Uh, and we've all realized we are a little overdue on our 10 year review of the area of impact agreement. Um, and so we need to schedule a work session um, sometime after August 26th. To discuss uh, and answer questions that the city council will prepare for you guys to discuss. What is that new range that we're looking at? After August 26th. So we got that's a Friday. There's that week, and then the following week is Labor Day. Does it have to be on a Tuesday. It can be any day you guys want. <laughs> have you got any input from commissioners and what their schedule? Um, so they are, are uh, they're on the ball. Uh, they're, they've already prepared some questions for their PNZ commission that they will uh, be doing on the 19th of July, I believe. Okay. That's Next Monday. Or we Tuesday, I guess. So this is, we're not meeting with them in this. Yeah, no, or just this is a work session for us. Yeah, month. so there's a process in state code that County commissioners prepare questions for the county PNZ. City council prepares questions for you guys. We all meet and discuss, get our answers to all of our questions, and then go back up to the higher levels and then go from there. Well, I'm pretty open anytime, like I say, other than a Tuesday. Tuesdays don't work for me. <clears throat> What about September 13th? That's a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. If it's early in the day, I can. Yeah, I don't know what the other staff, but I got to be done by 3, 3.30. Actually, I can be, be done by 4. A, a Tuesday evening is not good for me. Yeah, evenings are best for me. <laughs> what about September 14th? I will not be in town on September 14th through the 21st. Do you folks have the ability to call in? If they're not around. And while you all are great, we don't necessarily need everybody. We just need a quorum. <laughs> About the 12th. I will. Yeah, I will not be able to call in, but I don't need to participate if you have the quorum. The before the 15th is best for me. I I know I've got like eight days out of the state in the last half of the month. So. Would Monday the 12th work for everybody? Any day. As far as I know. We have a commit. We have another committee meeting that day. Um, the housing it advisory also, meeting. It would work for you guys to start the. Well, that's going to be done by five thirty. How long do you think this? I mean, I don't know what our time frames. The brains will be. <laughs> <laughs> what about the week before? The seventh, eighth. We have a meeting on the 6th, right? 
Oh, but we could Labor Day's on the fifth. start that meeting early or something and mm -hmm. maybe do a. Then our brains will be fried. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, well, yeah, we don't know what's that may be a long meeting. too. Yeah. So. The meeting is Tuesday the 5th. Oh, no, that's, I'm sorry, it's July. Other than Liz, was there anyone else that couldn't do the 14th? Is the 14th or 13th? Oh, 14th. I could do 14th. I I think I'm okay, because I but I don't have my wife made the schedule. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the last week of August? That'd be easier for me, probably. Yeah, that would work fine for me. Works for me. Yeah. So is that like the 29th? 29th, 29th, 30th or Tuesday. So 29th or 30th, or excuse me, 29th, 31st, or 1st or 2nd would be good for me. I don't know if you want to do it on Friday, so probably don't no, want to do it Friday. <laughs> Friday. How about the 31st? Wednesday, get to the middle. As far as works for me. Be fine for me. Yep. Is there an open line? Um, the not official, but team's calendar is open. I will. And Brian, would that start at four? Um, four works for you guys, but. How, yeah. how long are you anticipating? Um, I would say an hour to two hours. It was, what's the day we landed on? 31st, 31st is the day we are leaning on right now. Okay, that works. Yeah. We'll try to be Uber prepared, so hopefully it takes less than an hour and a half. Okay, and we're set for, at this point, August 31st at 4 o'clock here. And so I have one further question or request. Um, Brian, are we going to see Maverick on the August 2nd meeting? No, we did not notice. We did not send out public notice on that because they have not gotten us any updated documents. Okay. And did we notice all the other applications for the second? Uh, yes. Uh, well, we did not notice 49 Rio Vista, or no, it's not 49 Cami Lane. There's two 49s, that mean? Um, because they have not gotten us septic approval. There's a scene here. Okay. I was wondering if the commission would consider a special meeting in August, like that week or the week, it would probably need to be the week after to consider the short-term rental regulations. I think we could have a lot of public comment. And so we probably need to schedule it in a bigger space and allocate enough time and probably a special meeting. So I was thinking the ninth, the next week, if folks are willing and able. <clears throat> We're trying to get it through the whole process in August so that the clerks can do their renewal in September. So it's kind of a fast track, but it is something that makes me nervous to put on a regular PNZ meeting just because I think it could take a little bit of time. I will be yeah. gone that week, but that's not huge problem go to a special meeting is that what you're talking about once again tuesdays are tricky for me the week of which one did you say the ninth the week the of the ninth eight. i guess it could be any time that you guys are eight. available eight through the 12th I think it's mm -hmm. i have wide availability that wednesday the 10th I could do the 10th. So would this meeting be noticed? Public yeah, it would, just, it would be basically just one item. It would be a public hearing on the new, new short-term rental ordinances. I think I could do the, the 10th. Uh, yeah, I think 10th would work for me. 
Are we thinking four or four thirty type thing again? At a larger venue. Yeah, I think a larger venue at four if that works for you guys. I wait until five to allow for. I was just going to the public. No. Yeah, because if people are working, that might be, be wise. <clears throat> So what's the date? Then 10th, Wednesday the 10th. I know this will be public notice, but with the ramifications to the rental companies, well, is there a way to notify them directly? At least um, the big ones, not every single individual one, I guess. But, or do you have email? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, with it affecting them as much as it could, it would be good to have them all here as many as we can. Yeah, we can notify them. I mean, we contacted the major ones for the focus groups, so we have a list. Um, and believe me, word travels very quickly oh, among yeah, that yeah. community. <laughs> so, I think just at least if we get the major ones and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, and then obviously the regular public part of it. So yeah, I imagine there's going to be a lot of interest on both sides um, of the issue. So that's, I hate to ask you guys for a special meeting, but I think it might be warranted for that topic. You're just buying beer and chips though, right? Yeah. So, that oh. is. so, so Michelle, if, if the uh, area of impact it, it is, is not being considered in this, does it have anything with that? Would the fact that there's three area of impact mm -hmm. PNZ commissioners voting on on a city only deal does that have any uh, implications that we shouldn't be voting on? No, I think all, the whole commission can participate. It's a joint commission <laughs> for land use, and ultimately, you're just going to be providing a recommendation to city council on this. Okay. But why would it not be wise to have three commissioners? Well, I don't know. I I I didn't know that it would would be or wouldn't be, but I just was questioning whether or not, since it isn't a recommendation to county commissioners, it's only to the city. Oh, okay. Or. Yeah, and we can um, we're going to notify the county about this that we're moving forward with it. So if um, if you want to provide a recommendation to the city council and the county commissioners, I think you could do so because they may consider this ordinance at a later date. So I don't think it would hurt to provide a recommendation to both governing boards anyway. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that if the county commissioners don't go along with it, it just makes everybody's uh efforts a little tougher you know um there's yeah yeah i think i mean it is nice if the codes are unified it's just a lot easy to easier to administer as well as i mean the idea is that the whole area feels cohesive um and i'm guessing that probably residents within the impact area might also be interested in seeing these changes so um yeah, so I, I don't think it would hurt to provide a recommendation to both governing boards. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> All right. And I'm guessing with the is that's everything on that one on the basically August 2nd meeting. Since Maverick is not there, we don't have to change venue. Right. I have September and October booked out that the High school commons, just in case. Oh, okay. I'm gonna say that meetings are booked out already. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I was kind of jumping down to that, I guess. So, are we done with the agenda things? We go back to finish up on the signs. Mm -hmm. oh, we have three signs. Um, one of them is seen on the real estate. Lake Creek. So the Chevron gas station. Um, we got the window signage entitled as part of this station. Um, they are pretty much camped out on signage for that property. The lighting um, is downcast and these guys compliant. Um, 
and then they have their one machine on the side placed in the window and all of the rest things are interior signs and ways to go. Um, I learned that those little itty bitty trees and in the summertime, they have little itty bitty flower pots um, that all of the stuff that they have kind of like, like watering tubes attached to them. So they just have some clean ecosystem on their building, which is not a sign, but it's all about it. Um, so that's fun. The next one is an interesting one that is part of a concessionaire's agreement with the Parks and Recreation Department. So this is pretty much the only officially entitled sandwich board <laughs> in McCall, uh, permitted specifically by their concessionaire's agreement. There's no um, language in code for concession concessionaire signage. Um, essentially, they're temporary uses that operate out of facilities such as um, the Art Roberts Park where this one is um, or other locations like Cheap Grills and, and their boats, but they don't have an actual facility. They just have like a pedal boat that sits in the water and it's kind of like one of those beer bike cars. They serve alcohol? Mm -hmm. I think it's bring your own. Is it, well, okay, so they're not selling. Uh, I don't think they have a bar. We have our next meeting on it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wow. hey, hey, wait a minute. We, yeah. The one we need to discuss. That is so <laughs> the fun. one that's not public. <laughs> or, yeah. So that's there, and they get to keep their sandwich board in Art Roberts Park during their hours of operation, and then they'll throw it in their vehicle at the end of the day. Uh, they need like a little change to it and added arrows from the first iteration. What is the people so telling me actually do when I see it? He wants them to walk down to the boat and actually get on the boat. So they're amenable to that. It's, it's great. A, it's a pedal boat. It's a pedal boat. Pedal boat. So yeah, you sit on the bicycles. And it's got a big paddle wheel on the back end, but it also has motor to it, so they can really raise that paddle be boat. Lazy. Because I think they've had issues people with the wind; they couldn't quite paddle enough to get it back. So it does have a thing. So you can drive it around too. Yeah, they can get you back safely without getting stranded in the lake. Pretty clever. Multiple people, like you just yeah. go yeah. paddle. Like, it's like this. Have you ever driven through Boise in the summer and almost hit a weird vehicle covered in human beings pedaling as fast as they can no. and chugging beer? Okay. Nope. <laughs> well, kind of like, yeah, kinda like it's this. Like this. Yeah. But there's bikes instead of chairs. Like this. And it moves yeah. very slowly and makes a lot of noise. Yeah, basically, if we were all pedaling yeah, we just... tables around. Like we just had little pedals at our feet. Yeah. And, then and we would just sit here and drink our cocktails and pedal our feet. Yes. Yeah. Apparently it's a good time. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Sounds like it. They were out there on the 4th of July. I don't know if you noticed, but they were out in front of the Marine on the 4th. No, I don't. I don't. Go that far in the town on the 4th. Well, when you're done, just over the hill, right down below, you probably, it's probably there. Yeah, I will It's have to an interesting look. looking thing. I saw it out of the water over at Mission Street. I'm like, what in the world is that thing? <laughs> and I got a little looking at it. It's like, okay, yeah, it's the Boise bike thing, but on a boat. Yeah. Well. I mean, it sounds kind of fun and different. And then the last one is the Woodsman one. slash slash rustic is no more, and it has now become the Nordic um, to be friends with the Scandia across the street. Oh, yeah. um, and they have some nice halo lit signs. They're kind of like medallions on the side of the building um, within the allowable limit of signage and using a lighting type that is permitted by code. Um, Ryan, I think we're getting to the point where the admin approval is sort of there. We're just waiting on comments from yeah, you know, we'd really like my TD comments on that before we issue final approval for the building and landscaping. Um, but what are they going to do? I mean, I don't know when they painted all. We're going to talk about some more accents. I know they've done a few things and kind of dressed it up. Was there any more that was needed, or you think is needed? It's in a painted black to begin with on yeah. one side. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's well, really dark. Like, okay. yeah. So yeah. Was that, yeah. wasn't there any accents? Or was that going to come in? They added happened? a rust-colored wings coating around the bottom of that barn wood. Yeah, I know the barn wood. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that that meets at least the design guidelines for it. Yeah. I don't know without I like seeing this color brown. I mean, it looks good, but I don't know. But you do. Once the landscaping is matured a little bit, it'll... I was just going to say, yeah, I think the landscaping will yeah. take it down and just all of a sudden be black built in. But... So I they used to live in the other dark. office that was across the... Well, it's part of the Scandia, so I think they use the Scandia office now. Oh. 
and they're providing this is completely unrelated to their signage order yeah. and approval, but the back portion of the building on the lower level um, facing the further down Stiff Bank Street um, to the west, they've made that their um, workforce housing okay. within the building. So hmm. Yeah, they got quite a few apartments underneath there and, yeah. and behind. I, can't, I don't remember how many. There's quite a few. Nice little face lift. All right. Looks like it completed our agenda. Oh, and oh, I wait. forgot to put this on um, your radar oh, yes. um, <laughs> about this. This is just a random aside thought. But I'm working with um, one of the high school teachers and Bessie Joe, our city clerk, to create um, a youth council. And we're gravitating towards the idea of having a member of that youth council sit in with each commission or committee and learn about the civic process and, and represent like these voice on matters. And then maybe undergo a planning experience or, or do a long shelved to do list item. Um, so if you can think of any things that could be updated or looked into by young people. I've identified the, the call design guidelines being more than 15 years old in need of a refresher that maybe a high school group could take a whack at before bringing it before you for a presentation or anything else that might be um, something to ask a couple of 17 and 18 year olds to tackle for their senior projects. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to make the kids feel like they belong. <laughs> Keep that on your back burner for thoughts and suggestions. Okay. All right. That completes everything. I'm open for a motion. I'm motioning to uh, to uh, dismiss at eight. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not waiting that long. <laughs> Second day. <laughs> uh, at uh, six oh five. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, most carries, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. That Everyone. clock is so funny. It's like back and forth. It's like swinging between the eight and the seven. That's pretty clever. Really. Yeah. Oh, it stopped. It did it. It'll like, go up there oh, and it's going to back down. It's Like that. Meetings are done, so.